it's 10 o'clock. Let's go ahead and get started. So today we've got office hours with Todd Morrison. So we're going to be a little more casual, a little more laid back. We're just going to um, be taking some of your questions. We've got a number of your questions during registration. We also got um, some of the questions that we didn't get to in the previous sessions. And of course, you've got the opportunity to ask questions today as well. And of course, we're the Florida LTAP Center. We offer a lot of services, all of which are free of charge to the local agencies. So I encourage you to visit our website, floridaltap.org. Uh, once the session is processed, we'll have it posted on our recorded webinar section of our website, so you can find it there. And of course, we're on social media, F-L-L-T-A-P is our handle. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand things over to Todd to get us started today. So Todd, let me make you the presenter and we will go ahead and get started here. All right, thank you, Kristen. Yeah, and welcome. I'm gonna go ahead and turn on my webcam, at least for the, the first part, and just wanna say welcome to office hours. This is gonna be a little bit more casual, not nearly as formal as some of our webinars. So you will see me drinking my coffee occasionally. You may even see me put on my uh, old man glasses that I need to read anything up close anymore, but we'll definitely be a bit more casual in this. Those of you that are attending, you've been to the webinar series, so you already know my background. Retired from the Kentucky DOT while I was there, worked in maintenance, construction, a little bit of time in traffic. Since then, I've been teaching webinars like this one or in person training for the Florida LTAP, but also other LTAPs around the nation. And today is the opportunity for you to ask questions. We have some of those that were submitted during registration. We're going to answer those first, and then we'll open it up to the hands or the questions that you may have. And then we also have questions that were asked during the webinar series that we weren't able to get to. Have those prepared, and we'll get to as many of those as we can within the next hour. And a couple of things I want to share with you, too, as we get into the questions and the answers. First off, um, the questions you have, just so you know, I may not know all the answers. I want to go ahead and share that with you up front. And I'm going to be honest with you. If I know the answer, I'm going to tell you. If I don't know, I'm also going to say, yeah, that's a great question. I don't remember that off the top of my head, or I've never run into that situation. The reason that could happen is, if you remember, the MUTCD is a thick book. And I don't know very many people that might know all the answers, but I do know a group of people who are knowledgeable, and some of them are on this um, webinar today. Some of you listening have had a lot of time dealing with issues around the MUTCD. You've got a lot of experience. Some of you are like me. you got some gray in your goatee. You've got, maybe you're losing some hair at this point, or you just have a little bit of gray in your hair. If that's you, and we get a question that I don't know the answer to, or you have some information that you think would be valuable, especially from a Florida specific perspective, please be willing to share that. You know, you can input that as a question and Kristen is gonna be monitoring that and she'll be able to share that information. You could also, if you wished, unmute yourself and share that information with the rest of us. So a lot more informal today. The last thing is a disclaimer saying that what I share with you today is really just my opinion for the most part. Now, some things I'll quote directly out of the MUTCD, and then you can implement that how you see fit. But I would encourage you to, uh, because we're not looking at the entire situation, I would also encourage you to seek advice on it if you're still not sure about anything you're not sure about, um, any specific question you have. Go ahead and look it up. I'm going to point you to the right spot, but look it up and be convinced of it on your own or seek, if you're not a engineer, seek a professional engineer's advice on that situation. You know, if it's not readily apparent to you from your study of the MUTCD. All right, so with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the first question that we had submitted during registration. This is a great one. This says, what is the distance from the only or merge pavement message to the directional arrow? And now this is a great question because 
in the MUTCD. This is a uh, figure from the MUTCD 3B-27. In there, it shows the only word message and then the arrow, but we're not given the distance here. And as you study the text of the MUTCD, I really couldn't find a distance there either. And that means that it's up to judgment. But what I would encourage you to do is, and we have, by the way, attendees not only from Florida, but from other states, I encourage you to go to your state standards, items that your DOT has put together, because often they will go ahead and spell that out. They'll make it, uh, they'll put a number to that. And I would encourage you to use whatever your DOT is using, whatever their standard drawings or their traffic engineering manual, whatever it says, because the people in your state are used to that. And that means that you're uniform, you're consistent, and there's probably a really good reason that the DOT chose that. When we go to the Florida standard drawings, F dot Florida DOT, we can find it actually spelled out. This particular drawing shows uh, distances for only word message and the arrow. Now let me zoom in just a bit. I may be able to get even closer for you. Yeah, there we go. So you can see that from the stop bar to the beginning of this arrow is 25 feet. From the end of this arrow, or actually the bottom portion of the arrow, to the word only is 25 feet as well. That's what uh, the Florida DOT has in their drawings. And then if we take the fact, or you look at those standard drawings, you'll find out that the word only um, in their standard drawings is eight feet in height. So that means that from the bottom of this arrow to the top of the only is 25 feet minus eight or 17 feet. So that answers the question that we had of what is the distance from the only merge pavement message to the directional arrow? The answer is not given in the MUTCD up to judgment, but if you were in Florida, I would encourage you to fo follow the DOT's uh, lead on that and make it 17 feet or 25 feet from the bottom of one to the bottom of the other. That was the first question that we had submitted during registration. And because they were submitted during registration, we want to be sure to answer those. Here's the next one. It says, you channels, eight foot, 10 foot, 12 foot, when is it appropriate to use each different size. And so they're talking about uh, signpost, installing signs on signpost. When we look at the MUTCD, it really doesn't give us guidance on um, which particular size U channel post to use. So this is something you wouldn't find there, but what you will find are minimum mounting heights. All right? Minimum mounting heights. This is a figure, and you could uh, screenshot this or write the number down, figure 2A-2, you'll find it in section 2A, but it goes over the minimum heights of our signs, and it depends on where you are. Actually, all the MUTCD really says about the sign post themselves is that sign post shall be crashworthy. That means that they're gonna bend, yield, or break when a vehicle hits them. So sign post shall be crashworthy. You channel post were asked about in this particular comment, and when you read some of the FHWA documentation, the Federal Highway Administration, it says that a U-channel post that weighs three pounds per foot or less is considered uh, crashworthy. So if it's over three pounds per foot, let's say you need a bigger U-channel post due to the size of the sun and wind load, in that case, we'll typically put a stub in the ground and then we'll attach the U-channel post to it, uh, would put a anchor post in the ground and attach to it. You wanna make sure that that anchor that you put in the ground is not sticking up any more than four inches. Let's say that in our case, we're using U-channel posts that weigh three pounds per foot or less, and we're just gonna put one post into the ground. So the question is, when do I use eight, 10, 12 feet? Well, the answer is, it depends on where you are and what the slopes look like. And here's what I mean by that. 
let's say that I'm in a urban area. All right, so if I'm in an urban area, go down to the bottom left, that's going to be C, it, especially where I have parking or pedestrian movements. The minimum height from the sun down to the curve and gutter is given as seven feet. That's a minimum height. So now I need to look at what size sign am I putting on that? If it's a stop sign, maybe it's in a situation where I have to upgrade to a 36 inch stop sign. Maybe it's 30 inch. Let's say it's a 36 inch stop sign for ease of figuring. So 36 inch stop sign, that means that I need three feet worth of this post for the sign. And then I need seven feet down to the top of the curve. So in that case, if I were using an anchor in the ground, a 10 foot post attached to that anchor would be sufficient. But what if you know, I'm actually driving that post all the way down to the ground? Well, now I gotta consider the anchor. How long is the anchor? That depends on whether or not you're using a soil plate, which I highly recommend. Uh, it depends on the condition of your soil, the type of soil you have. For us in Kentucky, we used a 30 or 36 inch anchor. And most of the time with the DOT, we used a 36 inch or three foot anchor. So it was all one post, you would add that to it as well. So that's really, that's really how you know which size post to use. You know, if we were doing it in a rural area, then we have to figure out what's this distance from a string that's held level at the edge of the pavement out to the ground line. So we have to figure out this distance. And then we know it's five feet up to the bottom of the sign, the sign itself, and then however much we're gonna have in the ground. So the answer to the question is, it depends on where you're at, your situation. Um, you just have to do some calculations. You have to decide what's gonna be required at your particular location, but this is the chart that we use for guidance. All right, so that is the two questions that we had submitted during registration. And I've got a lot more that we could talk about, but at this point, I wanna open it up to other questions that you might have. Anything else that you uh, would wanna talk about or discuss, feel free to raise your hand. And as you're doing that, or as you're typing questions into the question box, I'm gonna continue on with some of the questions that were submitted during um, our webinar series. And as we get questions in, Kristen, just feel free to stop me and I'll stop at that point. Otherwise, okay. I'll just keep talking. <laughs> yeah, we do, we, do have, we do have a question that, that came in just now. Um, <clears throat> so this one is from Walt and he wants to know, are there different pavement markings on specs and standards, et cetera, and, or such as you know, thickness and glass beads for bicycle facilities? Okay, so that is a, um, a great question. It's asking about what are the requirements for uh, pavement markings when we discuss bicyclist issues? And the answer is, there's really not different ones. Uh, I'm gonna look to see if I have that question already in here. Yes, I don't already have that question in here, but when you read, Let me go ahead and, and find the section for you so that you'll know exactly where to look. When you get into the MUTCD, there is one chapter that talks about bicycles. Okay, and when you get to that particular um, chapter that discusses bicycle issues, you'll find a section on um, pavement markings. So this is part nine, part nine or chapter nine of the MUTCD, and when you go to 9C, 9C has the pavement markings. Yeah, this is part nine. This is the part that deals with pavement markings for bicyclists. All right, and when we get to 9C, this deals with markings. It gives us some general principles, okay? Um, first off, they shall be retroreflectorized. So the question involved glass beads. Yes, they gotta be retroreflective. 
for bike paths or bicycle markings, just like others. Let's see. We get down to standard number four in 9C.02. It says the color, the width of the lines, the patterns, the symbols shall be um, as defined in sections 3A.05, 3A.06. But when you look all those up, those are the things that are talking about colors. Uh, they're talking about the need to be retroreflective. Now, the question about thickness, the METCD doesn't really go into that. It doesn't have a requirement for thickness. That's something that it, you'll find in state standards. So if you go to the FDOT, I'm sure that you'll look at their standard specs or their um, maybe their traffic engineering manual, but somewhere in their specs, you'll find minimum thicknesses. You'll also find minimum retroreflectivity requirements. That's something to note as well, is that pavement markings just in the METCD, they're required to be retroreflective, but there's not a minimum retroreflectivity. That's one of the things that may be coming out or may be part of the newest version of the METCD. But at the moment, you know, there's the state has standards on the retroreflectivity, the amount of glass beads essentially, but the METCD does not. Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, we do have a comment from an audience or one of our attendees. It says that the NACTO Urban Bikeway Design Guide gives some advice and some options for green colored pavement as well. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So that is uh, something that I really look to be in the next version of the METCD as well. Yeah, and I'm very appreciative of you sharing that with me because I am not as up on bicycle standards as other parts of the METCD, but yeah, um, some of these are guys that we use. And again, I think you'll see a lot of that reflected in the new METCD. Yes, yeah, so I appreciate you sharing that. So let's go back to some of the other questions that were submitted. And again, Kristen, if we get more, please feel free to um, interrupt. Let me know at any point. Okay, sounds good. We have another one, but I'll, let me let you do this question and then we'll take the one from the um, attendee. Okay. Um, here's another one I've submitted. It says, where can I find the multi-stop justification in the MUTCD? And this is a, a quick and easy one. This was in section 2B.07. So that was a question on, again, if we have a maybe four-way intersection and perhaps two of the legs, the north and south legs, currently have a stop condition, the east to west does not, you get a request from a citizen to make that a multi-way stop or all four legs stop. We talked about some criteria on that needed to be met before we could consider that. And that criteria <clears throat> is in section 2B.07. Those are for all the um, shoulds that we covered in the webinar series. All right. so. What about the um, the question that you have, Kristen? Sure. Um, so this one says the R10-6 stop here on red sign at a signalized intersection. Does that mean a right turn can or cannot be made? So that's a um, a good question as well. That honestly, I want to look up to make sure that I'm giving you the proper answer on. But I think that's just indicating that you need to stop there when it was red, and I think you can still turn red. That's my first initial thought because there's a separate sign that we use to prohibit, to indicate to the public that right turn movements are prohibited. Um, but let me, I wanna walk through this because I think this is a good exercise for everybody and how do we check? How do we double check our answers? This is part 2B that I pulled up, PDF of the METCD. And what was that sign number again, Kristen? Sure, it was R10-6. Okay. So when you do that, this is oftentimes when I'm doing research or somebody has a technical assistance question for me, um, I always double check, unless I'm 100% positive and I can actually recall the verbiage exactly from the MUTCD, I always double check. And you can just do a quick word search. So that's the stop here on red. It's in section 2B.53, uh, so we can actually 
continue to search and go to that section. And then as you're checking that out, uh, you'll be able to really make that determination. Let's see. And just a quick look um, doesn't indicate anything that would prohibit a right turn movement. This one, no turn on red. This is one, the sun, the R10-11. So the answer to the question, the quick answer anyway, is I think it tells them to stop there, but then once they've come to a stop, they can still turn red unless it's otherwise noted or marked. Let's see, this one says, would you suggest replacing children at play with the W11-2 sign? We talked about this a little bit in the webinar and the children at play, the slow children at play, the we love our children, slow down signs, they're not standard signs and their use is discouraged for that reason. There are many factors that play into that, but one of those would be that they feel it believe, or they believe that it gives children almost a false sense of security. Like maybe it's okay to play in the street. Um, so its use, again, is discouraged because it's not a standard sign. We should really only be using standard signs. They wanna know, would I suggest replacing it with this W11-2 sign? This is the W11-2. This is the pedestrian ahead. It's covered in section 2C.50 of the MUTCD. And it says that these non-vehicular warning signs, including the W11-2, may be used to alert road users in advance of locations where unexpected entries into the roadway might occur. Um, and that's, to me, I believe, in my opinion, would be an appropriate use. So if you had a city street where they were requesting slow children at play signs, then I think that as a response, you could put up pedestrian signs at each end of the street, the W11-2, to warn the public about, you know, people may be darting out into traffic here. You gotta watch out, we have people that are individuals on the sides of the road. So how are we doing on questions, Kristen? Do we wanna, do you have any, or do we wanna move through the rest well, we of do the- have, We do have one, but I think the next question where we're talking about street signs, I think it, it may cover it. So let's do this and then we'll see um, if this covers what the question is. Okay, all right, excellent. This says, can you highlight, a, can you highlight where to find the exception for street name signs on a stop sign? Had a former employee assisted, we could not do that. Um, he recalls or she recalls knowing that, but other reasons you should not put street names on stop signs. So really two questions. The first one, is easy enough. I can give them that location. This is in section 2A.16. So in 2A.16, it says signs should be individually installed on separate poster mountings, except where one sign supplements another. So that might be like the turn sign and the advisory speed plaque underneath it. Uh, there's others, there's routing directional signs, uh, but then let's look at a few more here. C, regulatory signs that are grouped together. But D is street name signs that are posted with a stop or yield sign. And I did this a little bit different here. I, I wanted you to be sure to get 2A.16, you know, that reference. But again, if you go down to paragraph 5, 2A.16, you'll see these exceptions. And that's, that's where you'll find it. Now, the other part of the question is, is there a reason that you wouldn't want to put a street name sign on, a, on top of a stop sign or a yield sign? And I, I thought about that a bit. I'm trying to think, well, why wouldn't you put it? The only times that we didn't, or that we actually had uh, cities and counties not do it, is when, due to the length of the name, of that particular street or county road, the sign got big enough that it was actually a problem for wind blowing the sign over or making it uh, bend over. And so sometimes due to just the size of post or post that would be required to carry both the stop sign and the uh, street name sign, 
I have seen them in those cases separate them just because it was so much load at the top of that post. But otherwise, I can't think of any reason really that you'd want to separate them. But I could, again, turn that back to the audience. Can you guys think of any other reason why that you would not put street name signs on stop signs? Uh, maybe vertical obstructions or different, uh, oh, this is a good one, maybe different maintaining agencies for the, mm -hmm. the different signs. Yeah, whoever said that, go ahead and give them an A+. Plus. Okay, because that is one that I've run into that I'd forgot about. Yeah, absolutely. So um, in our particular state, in some of the highway districts where the city street or the county road came up to the state road, the state maintained the stop sign, but the city or the county would maintain the street name sign. And so they would put those on separate posts just because it was different uh, jurisdictions that were maintaining those. Yeah, that's that's a great reason too. All right. That, so this question that, that came in before, I'm not sure if they answered. I didn't hear back from. So let me go ahead and ask it, and you can let me know if it's there's some difference. I think there's a little bit of difference. Um, so for the use of an overhead D three dash one street name signs in Florida, just wanting some additional clarification. Uh, looks like it might be in, being interpreted by some that we are no longer allowed to install them on the same span wire that is used for our signal heads. Is it now required that when replacing these existing signs, we must uh, now hang them from a strain pole mounted brackets? Okay, so that, that is a little bit different question. That's asking about uh, not being able to put those on the, um, the span wire for the, for the signs themselves. And honestly, to my knowledge, that's not covered in the MUTCD. Uh, I can't think of any place where that's covered. It sounds like it could be a local or a DOT requirement. So let's let's ask the group. Is anyone aware of those guidelines or how that's handled in Florida specifically? And was that person from Florida? I guess is the other question. Uh, yes, I, be I believe that they are. Yes. So let me know if we get any um, answers in there. Okay, yeah, I sure will. And then just a reminder to our attendees, if you want to talk to Todd, just raise your hand and we are glad to unmute you if you'd like to ask your question out loud. And by the way, this section is 2D.43. That's what I've, I've pulled up, that section of the MUTCD. And I am doing a quick scan of the MUTCD to see if I'm, I missed anything. And I'm looking for the... Uh, you know, the span wire to see if that's in there where it says it can't be on that. And I'm not, yeah, I'm not seeing anything right away. So again, that tells me that's probably a local requirement and I really, um, I can't comment as to whether it's a local requirement or not because I'm not sure of all the local requirements that are out there. Now, the question may come up is, you know, why would that be a problem? Why do you have to do it separately? Could be that that's putting too much, uh, too much stuff hanging on the span wire and they want to separate those. That could be why they have that there. Yeah, I'm not, I don't see the reference to span anywhere in there. So that's one, all right, the first one where I'm going to say, you know, that's a local requirement, I think, or a state requirement, and I'm not aware of where that's coming from. So I can't help you with that one. But as far as the MUTCD goes, I don't see anything that would prohibit that. All right, so let's, um, do you have any more at the moment, Kristen? No, I do have a comment. Someone mentioned TEM section 2.2 .2, overhead street name signs. So they said TEM? Yes. So they're probably TEM talking about 2.2. .2. They're probably talking about the uh, traffic engineering manual. This is the F. Dot traffic engineering manual and 2.2 .2, overhead street name signs is what they're talking about. So you know, we're doing a little bit more informal today. 
I guess we could go down and look at that. And again, I'm doing a, a quick look. So it has installation, the location of the overhead street name sign on a signal strain pole and or mast arm may vary. However, it shall not interfere in any way with the motorist view of the signal heads. And then it has the preferred installation is shown in the standard plans. And that could very well be where it is located. Yeah, so here's a Here's a great spot for you to go. Um, I appreciate that comment. So what I would do is I would encourage the individual that had that question to download the Florida DOT traffic engineering manual and then go to the uh, standard plans. And that's probably where you're gonna find your answer. Yeah, so thank you for whoever um, submitted that, that help or that assistance. I did sort of scan through the traffic engineering manual, but if you can imagine, or if you notice, it was 220 some pages. So I didn't read the whole thing, honestly. I did a quick scan of it as I was preparing for the webinar series. All right, great. So let's we'll move on to the next question, unless Kristen, you have something else that has come in. No, it looks like we're good for right now. Okay. The next question had: What is the procedure to select advisory speeds for curves? And that's something that we covered in the workshop. Um, and so I'm thinking maybe that question came before we covered it, but just as a quick review, since we already covered it in the workshop, that is in 2C.08. It's in the section that deals with advisory speed plaques. That's the black and yellow advisory speed that goes underneath the curve of the turn sign. And there it has, this statement it talks about support it has established engineering practices um, and it says that you can use an accelerometer the design speed equation or the traditional ball bank indicator and then it gives degrees of ball bank that are allowed for different speeds and again this should be familiar to those of you that came to the workshop this is the traditional ball bank indicator on the left hand side the slope meter you can still buy these i've got one in the uh, trunk of the car ready for a web a uh, in-person training this week where we'll be using it but this is a ball floating in oil and mount this on the dash in a quick to go over it quickly you mount it on the dash where it's level the ball is above zero and as we go around the curve this is going to go up to the left or to the right how far it goes is a measure of the force on the vehicle and for speeds of 35 miles per hour and higher, that little ball can go up to 12, no higher. So it could go all the way up to 12, and that would still be a safe speed for that curve. Any higher, that speed's not safe. So we drop down five miles per hour, run the curve again. And so this degree of ball bank reading is a measure of the force on the vehicle, and the METCD allows more force as you go lower speeds. Speeds of 25 to 30, the maximum allowable force is 14 degrees. 20 miles per hour or less, it's 16 degrees. And by the way, this is different than it was done in years past. If you look at the 2003 version, we were really following AASHTO guidelines, American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials. And back then, the maximum allowable was 10 degrees for all speeds. That means that so the numbers were more conservative back then. That means that if you have uh, speeds that were set, advisory speeds that were determined 20 years ago, they're probably not appropriate today. What they found out is that was a more conservative number and people were typically going seven to 10 miles per hour faster than those advisory speeds we were posting back in the you know, 2004, 2005 or before. So they modified the table to take that into account. So speeds that are advisory speeds that are set today are probably gonna be a little bit higher. They're gonna take into account the difference in vehicles, the changes we've had in the roadway. That's also why when you look at this device that's been around since, I don't know, 50 years or more, it's black from 10 to 10 and red outside. 
because it's still showing that old method that we used to use. You can also use the digital ball bank indicator, but essentially you would take data like this, where you go around the curve at different speeds, you would get different degrees of ball bank reading. So if you go around the curve at 40, maybe it goes to 20, 35, maybe it goes up to 16, 30, it goes up to 13, 25, 10. These are the maximum amounts allowed at different speeds. So let me ask you this question. I know I did that pretty quick, but we had it in the workshop too. Given this data, what's the maximum safe speed for this particular curve in the southbound direction? Put that in the chat box. So what do you think? Given this data, given the chart down there that we use, what's the maximum speed? Maximum right, it looks like I'm seeing 30 miles an hour coming in here. And that's exactly right. Yeah, great job. And by the way, if you're curious as to how this particular device, the mechanic one, lines up with the digital one versus the design speed equation, the Kentucky DOT hired the Kentucky LTAP to do a research project, actually the traffic and safety section at the university, but we compared the design speed equation with the mechanical ball bank indicator, with the digital ball bank indicator, and also with the upgraded version, the cars um, version where you just drive through once in each direction. And determined based on that study that really um, all of these are acceptable methods. The design speed equation lined up exactly with the mechanical one almost 100% of the time, not quite 100, but very close, very reliable, it was like 98, 99%. The digital was very close as well. I think it was like 95% of the time it lined up. And when there was a difference, it was almost always just no more than a five mile per hour difference. So again, they determined those are good. The digital is a good device as well. And Kristen, I'm just gonna roll on through with questions until, unless we get some of the kind of comment or, um, question from the audience. Yeah, sounds good. Just keep on going and um, I will, looks like we just got one more question. So let me let you do this one and then we'll ask this one afterwards. Okay. This one says, when exactly, um, and by the way, we, we know people are typing things quickly. So I think they meant, how do I know when I need delineators? Essentially the application of delineators. How do I know that? The way that you know is to go to section 3F, and section 3F has guidance on delineators. It tells us when they're beneficial. It says where the alignment might be confusing um, or unexpected. Lane reduction transitions, curves as examples. Uh, they're really good devices at night during adverse weather. And so it's giving you reasons as you're using judgment on when you could decide to install delineators. It says you could also use them as an option, long continuous sections of highway or through short stretches where there are changes in the horizontal alignment. Horizontal alignment is just a curve to the left or to the right. To an engineer, that's a change in horizontal alignment. A change in vertical alignment would be like a, a hill crest, would be a change in vertical alignment. But anyway, we could use those to indicate, hey, there's a curve coming up. You guys need to be paying attention. That's in the first part of 3F, 3F.01. But then we get down to 3F.03. And if you're talking about application, this is very specific. And it gives shalls on when we need them. And you always want to follow the shalls if you remember. So shall be provided on the right side, right hand side of freeways and expressways and on at least one side of interchange ramps, uh, except when either condition A or B is met as follows. So it has that listed. Um, we go on down to the bottom here, it gives you a, another a should. A series of delineators should be used whenever guardrail or other longitudinal barriers are present along a roadway or a ramp. And that statement is one of the reasons that I purchased guardrail delineators. They were L-shaped with a little bracket that slid behind the guardrail post. And I installed those on every single guardrail 
that I had in my highway district. Now, one was because it was in the MUTCD, but the other motivation was safety. Individuals knowing where the guardrail is, where normally you have guardrail because there's some steep drop off or there's a bridge wall or something that's gonna be bad for the public if they get into it. And so them knowing that it's there and being able to shy away from it is a great thing. In addition to that, I also had reduced uh, cost on my guardrail repair. That was a unexpected side benefit is that I actually saved money on guardrail repair because I was using those delineators. We were able to track that and see that. But anyway, to answer the question, 3F.03 more specifically gives you standards and then guidance and options for delineators. All right, so Kristen, you said you had one come in? Yeah, it was actually just a comment referring to the previous um, question about the overhead street name signs. So it looks like the interpretation about not being able to install them comes from an interpretation of the um, FDOT 659-010, which I put a link for you in, in chat there, Todd. Um, so it seems like it's an interpretation of, um, so not a specification, but more of an interpretation and a design choice. So I just wanted to provide some additional information on that. So I went ahead and clicked on that. Ah, I see. So this is index 659-010 span wire mounted sign details. Okay, so you're saying it's more of a uh, design choice. Yeah, and there's a drawing on the second page that I think is where it comes from. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So this is, the drawing is 659-010. Um, this is by the way, the 2018-2019 standard plans. So I would encourage you to always look at the current standard plans as well. So when you go to, again, as we said at the beginning, do a little bit of research on your own, um, be sure to pull up the 2022-2023 standard plans just to make sure that there's not been any changes to that. But this is awesome, yeah. I really appreciate uh, the references that the audience provided and been able and Todd, to find this. Place. That's probably my fault. It looks like I pulled the old standard plan. So I just put the link to the, the current one in the chat there. So that's that's my fault. My apologies on that. Oh yeah, no, no worries there. Um okay. Yeah, so, so here's here's the new standard plan that goes over um, where that comes from. Cool. Span wire mounted sign details. And Kristen, that's okay. Don't worry about that. It's something that I always have to constantly catch myself doing as well, is looking to make sure that I'm getting the, the latest and the greatest. Now, if you're on a construction project, sometimes you got to be careful about that too, because um, when we are making changes like that, your project might have been let under the old standards. And sometimes one standard, the older standard applied to that particular construction project, um, but sometimes there are notes in there that said we'd upgrade to whatever the current was. So you really had to also read the notes of the, of the construction project just to be sure you were using the correct ones too. Yes, yeah, so that's fantastic. Love the collaboration that's going on today. So I have a, another question. This says, METCD one lane roundabout signing table shows yield control but a local agency changed this to stop control. Is this compliant? And the answer to that um, is found in 2B.09. And it says, let me get my right spot here. Yeah, a yield sign shall be used to sign right away at the entrance to a roundabout. So that's a shall condition, that's the use of it. So your question about a local agency changed this to stop control, is this compliant? Well, my, my answer is, based upon this statement, it doesn't meet the standard, I guess would be my answer to that one. And by the way, Kristen, uh, again, feel free to interrupt me, stop me at any point, but I think I'm gonna play a game now of answering as many questions as I can with the time we have left. So okay. if, if you're listening, grab your coffee, buckle in. Uh, but again, 
will always stop if you have something specific you want to know. Next one All was, right. what yeah, let me get, let, I'm going to let you get through two questions and I've got one from the audience here. Okay. What mandates speed tables or speed bumps? And this is something that um, when you're looking for what mandates those, you're not going to find it in the METCD. That was a question that was outside of the METCD. Now it describes signage for speed humps or uh, speed bumps, and it describes pavement markings. But as far as the application of those, when they would be appropriate, when you would use those, that falls outside the realm of the METCD. One place that I would point you to is this particular website. This is safety.fhwa.dot.gov, and it is a um, workshop on speed management. And one of the modules, module four, talks about the use of speed humps, uh, speed tables. Now, the difference between a speed hump and a speed table really comes down to size. When it's like 20 feet or more, now it's a speed table. But this goes over when that might be appropriate. It also has <clears throat> a reference to an ITE document that I think you'd find useful. <clears throat> this is guidelines for the design and application of speed humps. It has other applications on when those speed humps or speed tables might be appropriate. And so again, that's, a, that's an involved question, but I wanted to point you to this website because the, the FHWA, Federal Highway Administration, has some great material on that. And that could actually be a workshop in and of itself. It's just, we could spend a couple of hours going over that. All right, so one more, and then we'll get to the question that you submitted is, do you have to mount flags at the top of a new traffic pattern sign or can flags be omitted? And again, let me walk you through how that, or the thought process of how that I answer questions and how that I really think you ought to answer questions too that you have, because you can do this yourself as well, make some really good um, decisions. Do you have to mount flags at the top of a new traffic pattern sign? We have two things discussed there. The flags that come from enhanced conspicuity in part 2A of the METCD and the new traffic pattern sign, which is in part 2C. So what I would do is go review the language for each. And when we read about the new traffic pattern ahead sign, it doesn't have anything about flags being required. You know, as you read that, if you want to check that out, that's section 2C.52. And remember, the question is, do you have to? So the answer is, unless you have requirements of your particular agency or the owner of that facility, or it's covered in your traffic control plans for your construction project, no, the METCD doesn't require it, I guess, speaking for them. But you also want to read about the flags as well. And this is in section 2A.15, enhanced conspicuity for standard signs. And by the way, I had to practice that word conspicuity about five times to be able to say it. But let's go down to part E, adding one or more red or orange flags, cloth or retroreflective material above a standard regulatory or warning sign with the flags oriented so as to be at 45 degrees to the vertical. It's just saying that's an option based upon engineering judgment where you feel like it's needed. Then you can use any of these methods. So you have to answer the question, the METCD would not require it. Maybe a local requirement that you have does, an agency requirement would, but the METCD, no. But you could use it based on engineering judgment to draw more attention to it. All right, so Kristen, what was the uh, question that you had? Sure, so what is the length of a six inch white strip prior to the stop bar? Is there a minimum length of 100 feet only? Ah, so you're asking about that. That um, is also something that is typically found in standard drawings. So I'm going to see if I have that particular standard drawing up because I don't have the distance off the top of my head. Um, let's 
So I guess the first answer I have is I don't remember. But the second answer I have is that that's something we can probably look up if I can find the appropriate standard drawing for them. And by the way, if anybody has that right away, then you know if you know that right off the top of your head, feel free to put that in. Otherwise, I'm going to look to a little bit of research here, see if I can find that answer for you. Okay. Looks like this is the section. By the way, I am looking at Florida DOT standard plans 2022-23, and this is 711-001, sheet 5 of 13. And this would be the local guidance from the DOT. And it says that from the stop bar back, it's 100 foot minimum. Now, the other part of that question is, do we find that in the uh, MUTCD? And I don't recall that being on the, uh, you know, for the, or sorry, on the uh, figures in the MUTCD. So I think that's something that you have to go to agency like the DOT, the state drawings to see for sure. Now, like in this drawing, we have these solid lines, and they're not really labeled as far as a dimension goes. All right, it's a great question. Hopefully that answers your question, is I would look at 711-001, the Florida DOT uh, standard drawings, and that 100 foot would be 100 foot minimum. So I think you could go more based upon the way that's written. And that's what I would use, even if I was a local agency, because I think that I mean, you might modify it for existing conditions, but as much as possible, you want to follow the DOT's lead and guidance on things that are not spelled out in the MUTCD. So I have a few minutes left. Um, and by the way, if anyone has other comments on that, feel free to put that in the chat box We'd, or question box. We'd love to hear from you. Here's another question we had, and it said, why is the taper so close to the work crew? Now, I'm not sure which particular drawing that they were talking about, but I thought it could be one of these two that I shared with you. This is a closure on a shoulder. And this is a uh, flagging taper, the one on the right. And if you notice the closure that has the flagging set up, there's quite a bit of distance. This is a buffer space. The one on the shoulder, they're not showing a buffer space. Now, could you put one in? Sure, yeah, if you wanted to, you could put one in. But the reason it's not drawn in, in my opinion, is that in this drawing, where you're over here on the shoulder, you're not in a live lane of traffic. So you're still exposed, but your exposure is less than when you're in a live lane of traffic. And so I think that's why it's not shown on the drawing on the left for a shoulder closure, but it is shown on the drawing on the right for a flagging setup. But again, you could add one in here if you wanted to, for sure. As a matter of fact, on this flagging setup, they're not showing one at the far end either, beyond the work area, the black and white section there that I have highlighted or with a red dot is the work area, but between it and the downstream taper, you could add a buffer space there too if you wanted to, if you felt the need was there for it. Another question that came up is why are cyclists not considered in the setting of speed limit study? And that's that's a question that came from when we talked about the speed limit sign. This was in section 2B.13. That's where the speed limit sign is discussed, but it went into how do you set speed limits? You know, I, and I told you that first, that was set statutorily. 
you know, either by state law, city ordinance, county resolution, something like that. Uh, and then other than that, other than those statutory limits, we had to do an engineering study. And it has to be done within traffic engineering practices. And that's going to include the free flow distribution of vehicles. That means I'm not going to be right at the intersection. I'm going to get in a spot where my study itself isn't impacting them. I'm going to try to get their speed. And I told you that it should be within five miles of the per hour, the 85th percentile speed. And then this had a list of other factors that may be considered. And on this list, you don't see cyclist. I suppose the, it's a good question, why aren't they on the list? But the answer to that could be that when we're talking about the speed limits, we're really thinking about our typical road user, um, the average road user, and that's the passenger vehicle. You know, that's the typical vehicle that we're looking at. And so I think that's probably why that they're not on this, this list. Now, I also think, though, that as part of your engineering study, if you had cyclists present, that could be one of the factors that you consider. Um, I think that I'd be comfortable doing that. You know, this says other factors that may be considered, but I don't think that prohibits you from doing something else that makes good engineering sense. But again, that's that's my opinion on that. If you'd like some more guidance, there's some out there, and some of the guidelines actually do um, go into that. This is, when you go to the FHWA website, it'll reference this document from the Texas DOT. It says procedures for establishing speed zones. And as you review that document, um, it actually talks about cyclists. You know, it actually has cyclists mentioned as something that could be a consideration. So it expands that MUTCD list. So again, I think that's a perfectly logical and sound thing to do if you have a lot of bicyclists there. All right, so that actually brings us to noon. Do we have anything else, Kristen, or are we about ready to, to wrap up? I think we're about ready to wrap up. I mean, the only other question I have here, and I saved it to the end because I thought it was a good one, is you said you were a squirrel whisperer? <laughs> yes. Yes, definitely a squirrel whisper. Uh, all right, yeah, let me let me tell you about that. And I, by the way, I said noon, but it's actually for those of you that got a little bit nervous when I said that. I think it's actually eleven o'clock. <laughs> it is, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry about that. I I had set my watch to Eastern time, but I forgot that I set it to Eastern time, so I automatically added an hour to it. But anyway, squirrel, uh, actually not a squirrel whisper, but a skunk whisper. I'm a second generation skunk whisperer. So here's a quick story on that. Where my parents live, not too far away from our, where I live, I'm very fortunate. They're still alive, still doing well. They grow a large garden, but they have a lot of skunks and they're a nuisance. So my mother doesn't want my father to kill the skunks, but she does want them gone. So that means that what he has to do is live trap the skunk and then he has to take that skunk in the live trap and carefully carry it to another farm that they own and release it there where where they don't live without getting sprayed and in order to do that he has to be a skunk whisperer so he's been teaching me some of these uh, techniques so for example he hums quietly you know a nice uh, rhythm as he's approaching the skunk and as he approaches he has a tarp and he lays the tarp over the trap so now it's dark and then he will carefully pick that trap up covering up the bottom as well and set it in the bed of the pickup truck drive very slow to the other farm and then releasing it is just the reverse process so that's why i'm a second generation skunk whisperer to make my mother happy we have to relocate skunks rather than just removing them <laughs> well awesome i think that's a, a great way to to end our our um, casual, informal office hours here. <laughs> so, so Todd, before I let you close things out, thank you everyone to attending. Uh, I hope you found this uh, a good experience. I've got a few questions in the post survey. I'd like to hear your thoughts. We would, you know, consider doing this again in the future if this is something that's of interest to people. So, let us know what you think. And I hope everyone has a, a great week. And Todd, we'll let you close this out. All right, thanks, Kristen. 
Uh, yeah, I just want to say really glad that you attended, glad that you had questions, and we're happy to be able to help. Don't forget, though, we're not disappearing. If you get Tech Assist questions, be sure to submit those to Kristen. And they can be in other areas or topics as well, because Kristen has a network of people that she can get uh, good quality answers from. So great way to start the Monday. I hope that you have a fantastic week and I look forward to seeing you in future webinars. Have a great day, everyone. We'll talk to you soon. Take care.